Good morning. It's so good to see all of you this morning. Welcome to this worship service at First United Methodist Church. If you're guests with us, on behalf of the whole church, I welcome you and we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us. I want to invite you to take the attendance registration folder that you'll find on the row where you're sitting and fill it out and make sure that those who arrive later have an opportunity to fill it out as well. And you can also uh, take a look at it and perhaps learn a new name, put a name and a face together, uh, and make a new friend too in this registration process. There's a prayer request card also. If you have a prayer request or a pastoral need, you can fill it out, place it in the offering plate or in one of the boxes around the church. And if you desire to become a member of this congregation by profession of your faith in Christ or transfer of your membership from another church, then please fill this out and bring it with you during the singing of the last hymn. And with great joy, we will welcome you here at the front as a member of this uh, community of faith. It's so great to have our youth choir and youth choir alums providing our music and our service for today. They leave, that is the youth choir leaves tomorrow on its tour to Nashville. Yes, the youth choir has made Nashville. And uh, so they are uh, leaving on that, on that tour in the morning. We want to be in prayer for all of them. We also are celebrating Mark Burroughs today. This is Mr. Mark Day, you might say. Uh, if you saw all the goodies and the tennis shoes, that is Burroughs style tennis shoes on the tables out in the garden, then you probably got a clue that it was for Mark. Uh, today, uh, he completes 17 years directing the youth choir of this church. And I hope you'll take a moment, if you have the time after the service, in the hallways on the monitors, there is a video, and it'll be posted where you can access it later as well. Uh, on YouTube, but there's a video made by the kids, the youth, and alums sharing their greetings with Mark and images and the first song that he directed with the youth choir and then the one that uh, will close our service today. And uh, so, Mark, we love you and we thank you for, where are you, Mark? There you are, for your ministry uh, with us. I said today he completes 17 years because he's turning the reins of the youth choir over to Taylor Davis so that uh, he can be Mr. Mark in an even more intense way if that's possible and I can't even imagine how that is possible for him to do but uh, we, we are so grateful for that ministry. One of the best known most successful youth choir programs in our country and uh, Mark made it so. Uh, along with the youth who sang with him. One more thing that occurred to me, and that is there are kids singing in Mark's choir today who were not born when he started uh, the youth choir. So Mark is old. <laughs> or he was 12 when he started, I don't know. Well, I invite us now to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we enjoy the call to worship offered by our youth choir.
I invite you to stand now for our responsive reading and remain standing for our hymn, our affirmation of faith, and the Gloria Patri. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, if I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me and the night around me become, uh, become night. Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there is any wicked way in me.
Let us join together in affirming our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come to Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make you, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And now will you pray with me the prayer that is printed in your bulletin? Gracious God, in Christ all barriers break down, all social status becomes irrelevant. You call us to embrace one another as brother and as sister when we come together in Christian community. Grant us the wisdom to see the gifts each one of us brings to the ministry of your kingdom and the courage to make this circle of faith and service ever wider. Amen.
family to please come forward at this time that we might share together in the sacrament of holy baptism. God, baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and grace of God. It is a sacrament indicating that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we do or anything we are, but solely on the basis of the love of God for each and every one of us. Infant baptism is especially important to us in the church. It's a demonstration of God's grace coming to us before we even realize it's happening in our lives and in our midst. Jesus said, let the children come to me do not hinder them, for to such belongs the very kingdom of God. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church that Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Ann Peterson in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life. <laughs> Ann Peterson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on her as well. And Peterson, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's turn you around. You'll be happier that way. See? I should not brag about that. What a blessing it is to participate in this wonderful sacrament because in it, we pledge ourselves to do all that we can as a community of faith to help nurture Annie and Christ's Holy Church. Uh, we will uh, live the Christian life before her to our, the best of our ability. We will teach her the things of God. We will nurture her in the grace and love of God in Christ. And someday she'll stand at this or some other altar and make her own profession of faith in Christ. And This is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. To join us in our congregational response. With God's, With God's help, help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Ann Peterson, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life of God. I would like you to do today instead of sitting up here on the steps like you normally do what I'd like you to do is to come and you're actually going to sit on the floor down there and you're going to face this way and grown-ups who help facilitate that will you help facilitate that thanks <laughs>
All right, so it's the middle of the summer, and summer is a time for blockbuster movies. And one of the things that a blockbuster movie often has is a product placement. And so we wanted today's children's message to really be a, the blockbuster children's message of the summer. So keep your eyes out for some product placement. See if you can find where it is. register for VBS. It's July 8th through the 12th. We have spots open for kids, youth, and adults. Registration is in the garden right after the service. Will there be any sharks? No. Yay! Aw, man. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.
pray. God of our yesterdays and our tomorrows, you watch us scramble around in our busyness, and you see how much we miss the miracles that you have scattered all around us. In the church, we move in anxiety and worry, focused on what we perceive as scarcity, and miss that you have filled our lives with such abundance. As we offer our gifts this morning, may we do so with generous hearts, from a deep trust and confidence that your abundance is sufficient for all you have put before us. Free our lives from anxiousness, and let us dwell in the joy of your extravagant generosity. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
Gracious and loving God, what a great joy it is for us and must be for you when we gather together to lift up our hymns of praise, our prayers from the heart, and worship you in finding our common hope, our faith, grace, purpose, meaning, and especially unity as brothers and sisters in Christ worshiping you today. We thank you, gracious God, that you, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are truly one, and that we are also one in you as you continually reveal yourself to us that we might commune with you every day of our lives. We pray that through you, that unity and wholeness will bless our lives and our relationships, and that your world in new creative ways will find ways to put aside everything that will divide or separate us from you and others as we connect more fully with you and your kingdom in our very midst. Grant us the common goal of loving you as the first love that you have for us, and all of our hearts and our minds and our soul and our strength given to you, that we might use our unique gifts as well to love and serve others. We pray for our youth going out into the world this summer on mission trips to love you in a unified effort to share your love with others. We thank you for our youth choir singing their praises to you and going on mission tour and pray that they will have a great sense of unity, purpose, and love as they go out to serve others. And especially as we thank Mark Burroughs for the 17 remarkable years that he has shared with all of you, teaching our youth to love you and to serve you and to give themselves in every aspect of their lives to you and your grace. From different life experiences and opinions, Lord, we all come this day. But one thing is for certain, when we worship and praise you, you unite us today as one in your love and your grace, and we thank you for that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. To the Galatians. Before faith came, we were guarded under the law, locked up until faith that was coming would be revealed, so that the law became our custodian until Christ, so that we might be made righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under custodian. You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is nor, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Each of us has in our own lives letters that we received, I guess now emails perhaps, that we have received at a pivotal moment from a grandmother, mother, parent, from a brother or sister, from a dear friend giving us that word of encouragement or that word of challenge or whatever we needed to hear at that time that made a big difference in the course of our lives. It's 
It's true of communities. Uh, it's true that there are letters to the editor that have galvanized communities to do something about a situation in the community and has changed the course of that community's life together. It's true of the world and the nation as well. Letters that have changed the course of history. Albert Einstein's letter in 1939 to President Roosevelt or letter from a Birmingham jail written by Martin Luther King Jr. are letters that changed much. The letter to the Galatians is one of those letters. We're doing a kind of Bible study on Sunday mornings in these sermons that I'm preaching this summer as we walk through Galatians. Because the letter to the Galatians came at a pivotal moment in the life of the church when they were wrestling with very important issues. And so the letter was sent to the church uh, at Galatia to deal with those issues. One of the things that's unique about Paul's letter to the Galatians among the authentic letters of Paul is that Paul goes from the greeting directly to the complaint or the issue that he has with the church. Nowhere else does he do that. Generally, Paul starts with his greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ or some similar greeting to the people. Then he has a word of thanksgiving where he thanks God for this community of faith and what they mean to him. But the letter to Galatians, Paul jumps from the greeting, skips the thanksgiving, and goes right into challenging the Galatian church, asking the question, how could you so quickly have abandoned the message that I shared with you and have gone after some other message? Well, what had happened is Paul had shared with them the message of God's amazing and radical grace. We talked about that uh, in the first sermon in this series. And God had shared with them, uh, or excuse me, Paul had shared with them uh, this amazing faith of Christ, faithfulness of Christ, into which we are baptized, into which we enter and he talked about living out of that faith. And of course, we'll talk more about that in the rest of the series. But he challenged them with that. He challenged them also to embrace the grace that is theirs and not live by the law, but live by the Spirit. Not by the traditional religious practices. That's another way to think about the law that Paul was talking about but to embrace living in Christ with Christ as the center of your living. And then he challenged them not to abandon their freedom that they have in Christ. And the reason he had to make these challenges is because there were those among them who were saying, well, there's God's grace. Yeah, that's true, but there's the law and you have to follow all of the law. You have to follow all of those traditional religious practices if you want to be a follower of Jesus. All of those must be done. Otherwise, you're not in. And so they drew this dividing line between who was in and who was out. And many of the Galatians began to embrace that understanding and began to feel the burden of trying to earn God's love and God's grace through those practices. They begin to feel imprisoned by that. And so they lost their freedom that they had in Christ. And Paul is challenging them to return to that Christ-centered faith. And that was the issue that the Galatians were struggling with in their lives. And it's not that the law was a bad thing. The law served its purpose and it served it well to hold the people together, to create a community, to hold them together and to make them a people even if they were in exile, even if they were in captivity, even if they were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire as they were in the first century. It was the law and traditional practices that had certainly held them together. Paul said the law functioned as a kind of guardian or custodian, but that that time was over and there was this opportunity now by God's grace 
to embrace freedom in Christ, to tear down all the dividing walls, to use a phrase from the writer of uh, Colossians, to tear down all the dividing walls and to be one in Christ. And so this important letter was written at a pivotal time in the life of the church. And Paul said in our text for today, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. One in Christ. A life lived in Christ, centered on Christ. A community centered on Christ. Where all of those distinctions that were very important in Paul's day did not matter. The one that mattered most in Paul's day was this distinction between Gentile and Jew, Jew and Greek. That understanding from many in the early, earliest Christian community that you had to first become fully a good observant Jew before you could enter into the church, before you could be a follower of Jesus. And those who preached that had erected a wall that kept many people out. But Paul preached a different gospel. He said, no, no. We are one in Christ and we are set free from that and it's not traditional religious practices, but it is yoking yourself to Christ. It is serving Christ. It is giving your life to Christ as the center of your living. That's what creates a community. And that's the life of real freedom. In every age, this letter and other writings have challenged the Christian community along these lines. It was Jew and Greek in the first century. But throughout the centuries, there have been other issues. In the 19th century, the issue was slavery. And the church was divided over that issue. There were preachers in the South who could point to more than 100 passages of Scripture that tacitly accepted the practice of slavery, that saw it as a natural part of the order of things. And those southern preachers could point to those passages. But the abolitionists in that time pointed to other matters, more weighty matters of justice and mercy and being created by God and all children of God and the inclusiveness of the faith community. And these words of Paul, in Christ there is neither slave nor free. And they could point to the need to tear down those dividing walls. In the last hundred years, the church has wrestled with other issues. The issue of the quality of women, of women's full of the full participation of women in the life of the church. Uh, there are passages of Scripture that say women should remain silent in the church. And so the church had to wrestle. Is that really the heart and mind and will of God? Or is that culturally conditioned? Does it come out of the culture and the time and the place in which those words were written? The same for slavery. It was simply accepted as the way things are until it was cha challenged 19 centuries later, really. And the church began to see things in a different way. In these last hundred years, women received the right to vote in denominational issues. Women received the right in the last hundred years to vote in our nation. Women received the, finally the ability to be ordained in the Methodist church. But at every step of the way, there was this wrestling with the biblical text. And it's not a matter of the authority of Scripture. And it's not a matter of whether or not we take seriously and respect Scripture. Both sides, progressives and conservatives or traditionalists, whatever labels you might want to put on people, labels are always slippery. But the issue has always been not whether they take it seriously, but how do we interpret Scripture for our age and our time in our understanding. And so that's the issue that is at hand in the most divisive issue that we have today. And you all know what it is. You can't live in this country. You can't be exposed to any, any media without 
knowing um, about the issue of homosexuality and the way in which it is challenging the church and dividing the church. It's been in the news. Not very long ago, the Boy Scouts of America voted to become fully inclusive of the members of scouting, the youth in scouting, and that's gay and lesbian youth participating in all of their programs. As a result of that, you saw immediately that some churches decided to withdraw from scouting to cut off their charter. I'm so proud of the United Methodist men of our denomination who immediately said, and they're the ones who sponsor scouting and support scouting in our denomination. They said, you will have a home for your troop in the United Methodist Church. And that's been lived out in many places as troops were looking for a home. It is an issue that has divided us on so many fronts. Uh, it has torn at the fabric of the church. It is torn in some ways at the fabric of our society because it is such a divisive issue, an issue on which people disagree. Adam Hamilton, who is the senior pastor of Church of the Resurrection, United Methodist Church in Leewood, Kansas, which I believe is the largest or one of the largest churches in our denomination, wrote an op-ed piece for the Washington Post, I believe it was, in which he talked about this issue, and he talked about it in relationship to the issue of slavery. He mentioned in that article those hundred passages that would seem to support, at least passively or tacitly, the institution of slavery, and how the church wrestled with that and came to the conclusion that slavery was wrong, and that the church needed to be fully inclusive and do away with slavery, taking seriously the issue of freedom. He talked about that issue and he also talked about in another article that when we read a passage of scripture, let's take uh, a passage from Leviticus, one of only five, depending on how you read it, as many as eight uh, passages that deal with the issue of homosexuality. You take that passage from Leviticus and it says that uh, same-sex intimacy is an abomination to God, it's abhorrent to God, and it's the people who engage in that should be put to death. Well, nobody, well, virtually nobody, believes in the Christian community that there ought to be a death penalty for that. Uh, there are actually some people in Africa and some of the nations there that have pushed for a death penalty in their nation for that, but uh, yeah, we're, we won't argue about that at all. But the challenge is the, second, the, the first part of that verse, not the second, the first part of the verse that says it's an abomination to God. Progressives read that as reflecting the culture in that time and place, a culture that did not understand anything about orientation, that would only see such same-sex uh, intimacy as unnatural. So they didn't understand anything like orientation. The conservatives or traditionalists would say that it does indeed reflect the mind and the heart and the will of God, that it indeed in God's eyes is an abomination. Well, I believe, as does Adam Hamilton, I agree with him when he says that the issue of homosexuality someday will be like the issue of slavery for most people, seen as culturally conditioned. And I believe that the radical inclusiveness that we see in this passage and others, the way in which Paul does not want to build dividing walls, but Paul wants to make Christ the center, instructs us at this point that all are welcome in the community of faith. Leslie Newbigin, the evangelical theologian, says that the church is defined either by its boundaries or by its center, just as is the case of any institution. 
And he says, when the church has, as the Galatians were doing, sought to define itself by its boundaries, it has fallen into a kind of spirit-killing legalism. But when it has defined itself by its center, living in Christ, devoted to Christ, then it has defined itself in a way that draws people to Christ. I have to tell you that through many years, this has been an evolving thing for me. And I know that sitting in this congregation today, because I've had conversations with many of you, that, that we don't agree on this issue. Everyone doesn't agree on that, just like we don't agree on other issues as well. I've tried to be clear in those one-on-one -on -one conversations where I come down. And so I wanted to share that with you this morning. And listen, I have gone through change in this. I've I've wrestled with this, as many have through the years. Now, I think about two very close friends of mine in the youth group when I was in First United Methodist Church in Shreveport. Dear friends, gifted, gifted people. A real gift to the church. We, along with other youth, the leadership in that youth group, were down at the church all the time. Every time the doors opened, we were down there doing something or other, serving as best we could. No one knew that they were gay. We didn't talk about those things then. They had to keep it secret. When they did come out, eventually, they, they felt that there was no place for them in the church. We lost them. They were lost to the church. Sitting in this congregation this morning are the parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters of people who are gay, lesbian. And you know, as I have learned through the years, that they love as we love, that they serve as we serve and are as devoted to Christ as anyone can be. And that's true of our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters who are in our congregation as well. But I hurt for those friends of mine. We lost them to the church. I also had an experience a number of years ago when I was serving at the First United Methodist Church in Georgetown. In the lectionary text for that day, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch came up in the book of Acts. And as I thought about that text, I could not shake the idea as I thought, who are those among us who are excluded from the community today? You see, the Bible was really clear that eunuchs could not enter the place of worship. They were not welcome. But Philip baptized him. He became a part of the faith community. I talked about that in that sermon. I talked about this issue we're discussing today. And the next day or two, I received a letter from a couple who eventually came a few days later to meet with me. They were driving to Austin that morning, and it was a most remarkable thing. They were from a community 45 minutes away, and they were driving to Austin and they said, you know, we've never worshipped at First Church Georgetown. It's such a beautiful church. Let's stop and worship there. And they stopped in and they worshipped at the 11 o'clock service that morning. Two days earlier, their son, their only child, had come out to them as a gay man. And they expressed... Oh, their, their agony with that and, and how they were struggling with that. And when they shared it with their Sunday school class the following week, this was before they came to see me, they suddenly found a wall. It was as, as though those long relationships changed and they felt like they didn't have a place in that church anymore. It was terribly painful. And I said to them, it's 45 minute drive, but you're welcome to be in worship with us. For two years, they worshiped with us. But why did they have to drive 45 minutes to do it? We disagree on this issue. There's no question. We're not in agreement. We, it, it's just a fact. 
but we can still be one in Christ and love each other and seek to place the definition of the church as Christ in the center and let that define us and not the boundaries. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, you know the difficulties that we face as we wrestle with all the issues of our lives and we seek to be faithful. Enable us, O oh God, to remain one in Christ as we wrestle with this one. Show us, O oh God, what it means to extend grace and community. Show us, O oh God, what it means to talk with one another in love. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You will find our hymn of invitation on page 557. If you desire to become a member of this community of faith by profession of your faith in Christ or by transfer of your membership from another congregation, we want to welcome you as a member of this congregation with great joy. And so please come forward as we stand and sing together. Blessed be the tie that binds. worshiping with us. His name was Danny Moses. And uh, I had emailed him and I had gotten an email response and he said he enjoyed our church and everybody was so friendly and gracious to him. Well, this morning he came down and joined our church at the first service. He's a young black fellow and he said everybody had been so gracious to him and he felt so much at home in this congregation. I just felt like I wanted to share that with you. You'll be seeing his picture in our church paper, Danny Moses. Thanks, Lamar. I want to ask you to be seated uh, for our benediction today and then to enjoy the youth choir and alums as they share with us a song that has come to mean so much to them and so much to us as well. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.
我说我。